Hi, everyone, and welcome to 40 Minutes of Faith. My name is Barbara Cox, and I host this weekly podcast to explore God's Word and our relationship with God. Today's guest is Ollie Berg. I met Ollie at Workbrook Theological Seminary in Dubuque, Iowa, where he's studying to become a Lutheran pastor. Ollie didn't grow up with much faith. His dad was Christian, but his mom wasn't religious at all. Ollie came to Christianity because of getting a job at a Lutheran church as a choir director. Then he was baptized, heard the call while helping out with communion, and went to seminary. Before that, Ollie had some minor theater gigs as an actor in the semi-pro theaters in Portland, but he has so far been a lifelong student. Ollie's from Portland, Oregon, lived in Berkeley, California, and currently lives in Anchorage, Alaska. He's married with a little one on the way. Ollie's dreams are to hopefully be a beloved parish pastor and to write some kind of theology book one day. He's really into church liturgy, is a fan of the Roman Rite, and is interested in interfaith stuff with Zen Buddhism as well as Judaism. Welcome, Ollie. How are things in Alaska? It's really rainy here, and that's actually kind of weird. Is it not often really rainy? No, it's usually pretty dry, and then it's either dry or snowy. Last year, fall was two weeks long. This year, we're actually getting kind of a fall, so that's kind of nice. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I, I hope the rain will do some good and, and not end up causing harm. <laughs> it seems like it's either a drought or a flood, and we just want things kind of right in the middle. Of it. Oh, yeah. Right? But we're going to be taking a look today at some interesting things having to do with health and mm-hmm. what we eat and drink and what the Bible has to say about it and what the Lutheran Church has to say about it and mm-hmm. our common sense and maybe kind of how it feels to be having some health issues from time to time. Mm-hmm. Today's Bible verse is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So for those of you who are going to look up 1 Corinthians, it's a book after the Gospels, so it's towards the end of your Bible. I'm going to read excerpts from a longer passage that talks about what kind of food we can eat. Here's 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 8 to 9, and verses 11 to 13 from the message. But fortunately, God doesn't grade us on our diet. We're neither commended when we clean our plate, nor reprimanded when we just can't stomach it. But God does care when you use your freedom carelessly in a way that leads a fellow believer, still vulnerable to those old associations, to be thrown off track. Christ gave up his life for that person. Wouldn't you at least be willing to give up going to dinner for him? Because, as you say, it doesn't really make any difference. But it does make a difference if you hurt your friend terribly, risking his eternal ruin. When you hurt your friend, you hurt Christ. A free meal here and there isn't worth it at the cost of even one of these weak ones. So never go to these idle tainted meals if there's any chance it will trip up one of your brothers or sisters. Ollie, there is so much important stuff in these verses. How do you understand these instructions to us? For me, it's about what do we do with our gospel freedom. Yes. And especially coming from the United States, we talk about freedom all the time, you know, sure. but we talk about freedom as an end. Okay. And actually freedom is a means. And so we have to think about what we do with it, right? We have to actually <laughs> use our brains. Imagine that. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> That's the really exciting thing about this passage is Paul is saying that we should use our freedom, our food freedom, yep. which for Jewish people was a, was a big deal, still is a big deal. Tons right? of Kosh- rules in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and other places. Yep, in the Hebrew. Yeah. And Paul is saying, we're free to eat whatever we want. This is something Jesus gave us. But don't do that. <laughs> and by the way, here's some other things to keep in mind. Yeah. <laughs> So that's the fun of it for me is I think for a lot of us, when we read the Bible, we get to this point of, okay, we have this freedom. We have this freedom. Mm -hmm. And that is the message. Mm -hmm. But then there's this next step. Right. You know, and so that's what we have to think about. Excellent. And we'll be taking a look at some examples together. Our faith denomination has a document called a social statement about caring for health. I'll include a detailed link to that on the podcast website, which is 40minutesoffaith.com. I'm not going to read the entire 28-page document right now, just some excerpts. (laughs) Thank you. Sure. 
So on page three, it says, because human beings are mortal, suffering and death are part of our lives. Perfect health eludes us. Although health depends in part on individual behavior, it's also to a significant degree beyond individual control. Many factors contribute to health or its absence. Genetics, physical and social environments, individual behaviors, and access to care. On page 35, it says, imperfect health, which is as good a state of health as we ever have, does not mean we are forsaken by God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Ollie, it seems to me that part of American culture is a vision of perfection, even if Mm -hmm. it's artificial or untrue. How did you feel when you received a recent diagnosis of diabetes? You know... I quite literally felt like I had sinned against God. I felt awful. I remember when I was little, elementary school, we, I, had a, I had a teacher who her son was diabetic. Mm-hmm. And I think what she was trying to do was educate kids on how, hey, it's totally okay to be diabetic. You know, there's mm-hmm. nothing different about that. Here, let's, let's prick the finger and show you how that is. And the teacher did it and her son did it. And I, I was like, I don't want any of that. <laughs> Not no, for no, me, no. please. No. <clears throat> and so I think God laughed. And then yes. 20 years later, I got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Mm-hmm. And I just instantly remembered that moment and, and how afraid I was and how this is something that I've been trying to avoid. But I hadn't been eating well. You know, I've been consoling myself in food and trying to deal with the stresses of living in Berkeley, California, and the stresses of being in a new city, being a new kind of person, right? I I was only recently Christian. I had moved to Berkeley to go to seminary and uh, taking on all these new different things, new people, maybe people that I wasn't friends with them immediately. It takes a while. And I was just, I was eating a lot, you know? Which is pretty normal. You're not alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I woke up one day, I was starting to develop what they're called xanthomas, when your cholesterol is so high that your cholesterol needs somewhere to go. So you get bumps. I go to the doctor, I have diabetes. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Sounds like it was a big shock. And Uh now we're dealing with the ramifications. And I feel bad because I am avoiding gluten and dairy products, but I imagine that there's more workarounds for me. Like I can make gluten-free baked goods, but I can't figure out how to do a sugar substitute in your case. Have you gotten some good advice? Is it still as devastating now as it was when you first found out? Not devastating. I've been able to figure out a lot of substitutes. The hard part is that carbs are carbs, you know? And I kind of told myself this story. Oh, if I switch from the regular pasta to the lentil pasta, you know. Or yeah, the, we did that too. Yeah. I was like, oh, that'll fix everything. No, it, okay. it's still carbs. They're better carbs. Yeah. But they're still going to affect my sugars. Right. The hard part is snacks, right? All snacks are carbs. I haven't figured out a good solution. You know, cheese and meat is good, but I, I don't know. You get like sick of that eventually. Things. Yeah, exactly. I'll take your cheese that I'm not supposed to be eating. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, let's keep exploring this because there's a lot of different angles, including the Bible verse and the social message. Mm -hmm. One word that's not in today's passage, but is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible is fasting. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about fasting for health or faith reasons, especially as it might relate to requirements around our health situations? The first thing when we think about fasting is be careful because it's trendy right now. Exactly. And when things are trendy, they get out of hand Mm -hmm. because intermittent fasting, and for some people, it is a good health, but for a lot of people, it might not be. As a diabetic myself, I can't. Exactly. But fasting actually is, I think, a really important part of our calling as Christians that especially as Protestants, we've lost. Because, for instance, Luther in his small catechism, he mm-hmm. talks about how to prepare for going to communion. Okay. And he says, fasting is a fine principle. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people would fast, and that's how they would prepare. And actually, 
it's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Because when we fast, if we think of it as we are entering into the suffering of the world, Right. I'm not going to eat. And some my siblings around the world literally don't have enough food. They don't have a cupboard that they're denying themselves. Exactly. So we who are lucky are saying symbolically, I can stand in solidarity with them. Mm-hmm. But I do this in freedom. Okay. Nobody's right? forcing me to. I'm not trying to earn points to get into heaven or. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And it's good because we're imitating Christ. Mm-hmm. And. Then as we're imitating Christ, we've been fasting, we go up to the table. And as St. Augustine says, we receive what we are, right? The body of Christ, we receive the body of Christ. And we remember that we have nothing. We go up with empty hands and is placed in our hands is everything. And that's a great gift. That's why we have that freedom. Mm -hmm. As you and I are maybe health compromised, we just have to adapt our fast. Okay. So rather than not eat any food for prolonged periods of time that might mm-hmm. throw us out of whack. Mm-hmm. We instead should eat maybe just the minimum yep. during our fast. Just the minimum. Or Which is we fairly sh- un-American unless you're, <laughs> you're in a tough financial situation and literally don't have enough food. Right. And that's interesting too, because sometimes when we get really poor in America... The cheapest food is the worst food for us. McDonald's, yeah. yep. you know? Yeah. And so even when we have to think about eating the right thing, yes. maybe, that's our fast. Instead of eating less, we just eat right. Yeah. Caring for the body that God has given us to the best of our abilities. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to actually broaden this a little bit because even though the passage in Corinthians talks about meat, the yeah. ELCA social statement has a few sentences on some other things that I'd love to get your take on. Hmm. On page seven, it says, each of us has responsibility to be a good steward of his or her own health out of thankfulness for the gift of life and in order to serve God and the neighbor. This mm-hmm. means taking effective steps to promote health and prevent illnesses and disease For example, eating well, getting adequate exercise and sleep, avoiding use of tobacco and abuse of drugs, limiting alcohol, and using car seat restraints. It means balancing responsibility for health with other responsibilities. It also means seeking care as needed, recognizing that disability, disease, and illness do occur, even to those who are good stewards of their health. How about that? You know, it's funny because it's really really spot on and- Maybe it's almost obvious, right? Yeah, but do we do it? (laughs) Yeah, right. It's funny how we are trying our best to do something. Mm -hmm. We're trying to exercise. We're trying to eat right. And then all of a sudden, for me, it's always actually about Wednesday or Thursday. I realized, how did I get out of control? Yesterday, it's like I ate six different pasta dishes. How did, why? (laughs) And I looked at my blood sugars and I go, I know this is bad. What am I, what's going on? (laughs) So it's a conscious thing. And also it's a commandment. And I know, again, we talk about freedom and we talk about we're as Lutherans and we're worried about law. I want to know what should we do? If my doctor is quite literally being like, hey, you need to eat right, you need to exercise. If my church is saying, hey, you need to eat right, you need to exercise. Barbara, what do you think that means? Yeah, and that to me also sounds like the Bible verse about not leading our siblings astray. And one of my friends in college actually didn't drink. And the reason for it was this verse that some people have a hard time controlling their drinking. And to create an environment where, and I talked with Michelle about this in a different episode, can you actually have fun without alcohol? Can you have moderation that doesn't result in kind of stumbling down the street? So how about leading our siblings astray with our own behavior around consumption? Yeah, we can definitely think of that part as our imitation of Christ, our emptying out. I've been really dwelling in Philippians too lately. Okay. And I see a lot of Philippians 2 in here of that self-emptying of Jesus and that we are graciously joining in when we say, I am going to help my neighbor by not drinking too much or drinking at all. Mm -hmm. 
I think the same principle is the principle that the reformers had in mind when they said, let the priests marry. Okay. You know, maybe there's a freedom to do anything we want, which is kind of radical if you say that about drugs. Yeah. But we shouldn't. <laughs> well, the greatest commandment is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. So how do we love our neighbor? We first treat ourselves right with what we put in our mouths. Mm -hmm. Because if we do that, then at least we're thinking about someone else when mm. we do it. If we won't do it for ourselves, do it for someone else. That, that's always helped me. Maybe won't help someone else, but you know. Yeah, we need food to live. There's just no yeah. doubt about it. So what, what about optional foods and beverages instead of what we just need to survive? What? Well, we need the basic nutrients that our doctors and nutritionists are recommending to us. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Have some cake on your birthday or whatever. But I bet those six pasta dishes were, I really hope they were fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm thinking more <laughs> consuming that we really don't need to be consuming. And mm -hmm. it seems to me like you go to a restaurant and you get a portion that's the size of a frying pan. You know? Yeah, that's a good question. Orthodox monks are really good at keeping the fast because it's sort of like their full-time occupation in a way. And they always, right before the end of the year, will eat like a little piece of cheese, which is prohibited from the fast, so that no one can say that they kept the fast, right? So it's not works righteousness, it's not proving how good I am. Exactly, so birthday cake. You should eat birthday cake, especially if it's your birthday or if it's sure. your friend's birthday. Sure. Yeah. You know, deny yourself a little bit maybe, especially if I got the big piece of cake, right? I'm not going to deny it. I probably should at the next birthday I attend, God willing, <laughs> that we can ever go to birthdays again. Right. You know, that I'll eat the small piece of cake. But food is not just nutrients. There's something dehumanizing about thinking of food as nutrients. Mm. You know? There's no joy in that. Yeah. Because I'm sure Jesus didn't eat just because you got to eat. We know Jesus went to weddings. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah. was probably some feasting there. Yeah. So I think part of our call is to enjoy one another. Mm. And that might mean eating out a little bit. Sure. But of course we have to be aware of our health. And part of our health is our social health of eating too. Exactly. And that's my next question, because we do make choices on our own dealing with food and social expectations. But I'm thinking church potluck dinners, outdoor get togethers, and people are saying, try my homemade, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. so then that involves our neighbors might not think we're loving them. If I'm like, no, 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 I can't. Thank you for offering me this, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. some social aspects too of you say, love your neighbor. Fine. But sometimes we have to set limits. Right. And man, if you can figure out a great way to balance that, like you should publish a book because I don't know. For me, I think about, I, I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> sure, most of us are. You know, so I will, oh, try this. And I do want to try it. One, because I love food sure. and I want to make someone happy. But sometimes it turns into, okay, am I trying this? Or am I just now eating another meal? Because <laughs> it's been hoisted upon us. But that shows something really amazing about Jesus and how Jesus works through us is that food is more than just food. It's uh, like pumpkin pie, right? Pumpkin pie is a whole story, sure. you know? Yes. You know? My mom hates pumpkin pie. She okay. makes it every year. Aww. We love pumpkin pie. And that's a whole story that we can kind of share together. Yep which is why we go up to the table and eat a meal because we're sharing in that story. And Jesus says, here, this is going to be my body, this bread, because bread is a whole story. A meal is community and yeah. a challenge too, because we eat too much or we don't eat right. And that's also part of the story. We can't deny that bit, I think. It's really hard. I've been to various different weight loss meetings and techniques and stuff. And sometimes they say, 
can you just eat one spoonful? Because does the 10th spoonful taste any better than the first spoonful? Or does mm -hmm. the 10th spoonful taste any different? And if it's the same, then do you really need 10 spoonfuls? But even sometimes if you had 10 different spoonfuls of 10 different desserts, that's probably not good either. Right. So how do we say to someone, I care about you, whoever it is that made this delicious dish. And I'm also trying to take care of myself. But yeah. We talked a little bit about superficiality and perfection. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have, of course, I'm going to eat all of this because I want to make all these other people happy. Well, and it tastes good, but it's not <laughs> for me. I'm going to suffer the consequences. Yeah, I really like what you just said there about really what, what we need to do is enjoy the person. Yeah. And yeah, they're giving you this food, but isn't that just the same way of saying also like this here is my body too. We do this too. Jesus says, this is my body, here's some bread. Mm -hmm. And the lady at church says, this is my body, here is some jello salad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I say this because as a preacher man, I can think of really good things to say, but do I practice this? <sighs> no, I'm bad at this. When you're at a potluck, at least it's easier wandering around the room. And someone gave me a plate one time and half the stuff on it, I wouldn't have picked for myself, but they were trying to be nice to me. And yeah. so I was just able to wander around and it was just a little paper plate full and I put a napkin on top mm -hmm. of it and got rid of the stuff that I knew wasn't good for me because I didn't want to embarrass the lady who was trying to be nice to me. But it's right. harder when you're at someone's house around the table. And this whole social statement is also designed to facilitate conversation doesn't have to be in a church, but in general, can we have a conversation about what are we having at church? I love donuts and they're a huge temptation and they're not good for me. They're not good really for anybody, mm. but <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's easier when you have painful consequences later from eating something. But if you don't have painful consequences and you're just like, oh, I know this isn't good for me, <laughs> it's harder to resist. Well, and I'm really good at forgetting about the pain that I suffered. So, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'll be fine. I'll be mm. fine eating all these donuts. Yeah. What? Well, you know, it's funny because this same conversation about what we eat at fellowship is not just about health. It's also about race. Okay. And it just shows that actually this question is hard, no matter how we approach it. For some reason, eating together after church is a lightning rod because somebody says, well, what about a boy brings tamales? Oh, yeah. Then someone's like, but does that mean we can't have jello salad? Okay. Then someone says, well, we need to eat healthy. What about the carrot cake? I know. Yeah. So I don't know how we have this conversation. Like, have, Well, have I don't you... mean to sound like I'm judging all these people who are pushy with food. I'm trying to protect myself yeah. and trying to not hurt their feelings. But exactly. we also judge in the other direction too. And on page eight of the social statement, it says we should take care not to blame people for their health problems and work to minimize both the stress of coping and the potentially isolating stigma of some conditions. Most of all, we stand ready to be present with and care for those who suffer whatever the reason. That sounds just like Paul. That's awesome. Lots of judgment going around all over the place. <laughs> We're so good at that. And that's not our job. Mm. Maybe to care for each other, to alert each other. Fine. There's this ethical vision, I think, in Christianity that we can't do in this world. And it's that we would always be so pointed outside of ourselves. Like I would always be so worried about you, Barbara, okay. that I would never worry about myself because you're worried about me. You're caring for me. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have to worry about my needs because I can worry about yours. It's impossible because we're broken. Yeah. And that judgment is so strong. And are you called to disregard your own health in the interest of others. And some people might say yes, but in your blog, you wrote, I'm called to be diabetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how am I going to serve other people if my diabetes is raging out of control? And yeah. for a while, you can probably get by with a lot of different health situations, but eventually it's going to catch up to you. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the thing is I heard that call mm -hmm. from someone whose job it is to care about me, my doctor. Yeah. And I, I think I said in that blog, that that means that it is a commandment coming from the voice of God. And it's my personal commandment. Mm -hmm. Because the way that I can care about others' needs, and so it is actually a, a self-sacrificing thing, mm -hmm. is by worrying about my blood sugars mm -hmm. and my diet. 
I think of my baby on the way. She's, she's, oh, she's itty bitty. Oh my gosh. She's, we're, we're in the third trimester. She's only she's a little She's got a spine over. that we she's saw. She's got a spine. That's right. <laughs> Very exciting. You know? And so yeah. every time I check my blood sugar, I can think of her. Yeah. And I can think of my wife. Mm-hmm. It's never helped me to think of myself, mm-hmm. you know? So it's better for you to do it for other people because you want to be around for her high school graduation, God willing, and many years after that too. Mm-hmm. But and yeah. we don't know the hour of our final calling that, for any of us either. Right. But if this is something that someone who's a subject matter expert, your doctor said, this is what you need to do medically to care for yeah. what God has given you, then let's do that. Yeah. People whose jobs it is to know about this stuff. hmm we should listen to them. (laughs) And systems are really important to me too. I have a question about that for you. On page 13 of the social statement, it says, healthcare as a shared endeavor entails a comprehensive and coherent set of services of good quality care throughout one's lifespan. At a minimum, each person should have ready access to basic healthcare services that include preventive, acute, and chronic physical and mental health care at an affordable cost. The United Mm -hmm. States does not currently have a healthcare system that is capable of care for all people. And then it goes Mm -hmm. on. There's lots of different advocacy kind of stuff. So even though I have good health insurance, my co-pays and deductibles are a lot. I worry that some people have a tough decision when it comes to the cost of medications and the ease with which we can buy cheap food, which you referenced earlier, that might be less healthy for us. Whose voice is missing from this conversation? I think it's the voice of the actual poor. And it's the voice of uh, people have to make a decision. Are we going to eat tonight or are we going to pay this medical bill? And the thing that I think of is that that means that that's also my wife and I, we have good jobs. We we're educated. And yeah. that I think means that we're poor because we have bills that are, that are crazier than we can ever believe. And so like when I hear that, when I think about how are we going to afford this cost and people don't afford the cost, I think about those that can't even afford the deductible. I just <laughs> want to sort of have a call to justice along with this conversation about how do we eat less gluten or less sugar or something like that, that people who might not have any health problems, or even if you do, I'm willing to pay more taxes so that more people can have healthcare coverage and that someone isn't saying, well, if I buy my insulin because it's not free, then I probably can't pay my rent, especially with people getting laid off during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. So just to raise that awareness. That's why I really liked this passage in Corinthians is, yeah, people are like, I don't wanna pay more taxes. You know, the government's already taken more money from me than they should. That's true. (laughs) Yeah, of course it's true. Yep. And they're not using our money right. Exactly. You know, they're spending it all on the military. And which is whatever, you know, it's it's important. And our funds are not being used well. Mm -hmm. And yet. Right. Or is my paying taxes, as Paul says, going to cause another one to stumble, you know? And is my not paying taxes gonna cause another to stumble? Yeah. So if I can, if what I can do is pay more taxes and that might help my neighbor, yeah. that's good, Yeah. you know? That's part of me giving up my rights as Jesus gave up his mm-hmm. rights for us. Yeah. And another thing that comes a little bit from my social work background, but it's also in the ELCA social statement is about people's right to make their own decisions about their own bodies. And on page Mm. 22, it says, a dominant principle in healthcare ethics is the right of individuals to be freely self-determining with regard Mm. to their own bodies and medical treatment decisions. This principle rightly protects against unjustifiable medical and familial paternalism. This church supports an individual's freedom to make healthcare decisions according to her or his own conscience and moral discernment. And that goes back to what we were talking before about judging each other in all different directions. So if someone is going to say, you know what, I'm not going to follow this doctor's advice or whatever, that, that they have the right to do that too, even though we don't want them to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's where loving each other gets really hard. 
Mm. You know, because when we love somebody, we weirdly want to control them. Maybe out of safety, you know. <laughs> sure. But true love is letting is you know think about the first time you really loved somebody. Mm. What you loved about them was them, right? And and their freedom and who they freely are. And sometimes we we try to box that and and package it, but but people change. People are always free to change, and so our love has to always be sort of rooted in that. Mm-hmm. And so when when someone makes a stupid decision, the question is: Is do we love people because of who they are, or because they agree with us? Sure. That's, That's a great question. That is hard. Yeah. Oh, man. And yeah. another biblical concept that's not addressed in today's passage is about healing. And I'm mm-hmm. wondering if you could talk for a minute around your thoughts of, you know, some people are healed and some people aren't healed. And it's not a judgment either. That's not how I see it, that, you know, if I'm good enough, God will heal me. Or if I pray hard enough, God will heal me. Yes, God answers prayers and in different ways. Mm -hmm. for everyone. So when you talked in your blog post, you know, shout out, we'll put that on the, on the website too. So people can check it out. You're living God's calling of how you were made with or without diabetes. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah, you know, in the old Testament, there's a lot of our, our heavenly reward really is just long life. You know, if we're righteous, we get a longer life. Mm -hmm. If we aren't righteous, we get a short life. Mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. <laughs> you know maybe but really the thing about life is that life is grace to be born is to is to is, is an act of god's grace likewise dying is an act of grace you know and when god calls us to die mm-hmm. we have to just sort of be ready that to know and to trust and to have that faith that, well, this is what's best for me. I think of, I love monks. I think of, yeah, I I love monks. I, I, my radical thesis that I will say probably nothing else is that Protestantism is an experiment in trying to make the whole world a monastery. And I'm just going to drop that and then walk away from it. No, 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 no. How's that? (laughs) (laughs) Because, because, because marriage, mm-hmm. right? Marriage is a call to permanently being with somebody as mm-hmm. best as you can. Yes, of course, these things are going to break down, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's why divorce has to be okay. Mm-hmm. And we have to have grace for divorced people. But the idea being that mm-hmm. here with this person, I'm going to discern God's word for me. Mm-hmm. I'm going to discern how to love my neighbor. I'm going to discern how to pray in this way, with with this person, these people. The monastery is a place of always discerning how to love your neighbor and how to do it in a certain way. Okay. And as Protestants, we're saying that that idea is our whole lives. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to work. Everybody has to do that. And that makes it hard. Mm -hmm. But the reason I say I love monks and I bring this up, that was just a weird tangent. There's There's a monk that I think, I think I just saw a video of him talking about his life Mm -hmm. and he's blind. Okay. And he says with such confidence, he says, I know that it was for my betterment for, for the good of me that God made me blind. Mm -hmm. And I think that God made me diabetic because it's good for me. You know, this is for, this is the best for me to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Mm. You know, I don't know why people get cancer. Yeah. And it might not be liberating for someone to say, right. This is, this is for my betterment that God gave me this. Yeah. But my conviction is, is that God is working something good in this moment, Mm -hmm. this moment of crap. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a, a perspective I can only come to because of the freedom God gives me. Right. And I got to be cautious and preaching. We all do. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, somebody's going to be mad, probably no matter what we say. <laughs> anything. Oh, man. Well, and you're not talking to make people happy. You're talking about your, your sincere, or we are talking about our sincere beliefs and mm-hmm. trying to be as kind and gentle as possible. But every once in a while, a prophetic voice that's not necessarily kind and gentle is okay too. <laughs> Maybe just not all yeah. day, every day. You know, and but there are some people that are good at that. Mm. The all day, every day, I'm prophet of the Lord, and yeah. I more power to them. I, I don't know. I can't even hang out on Twitter long enough without no. you know wanting to shrink yeah. up and die. Yeah, I, you know. Yeah, yeah. So we're not saying you have this horrible situation because God hates you, or God wants to punish you, or you did something bad to deserve it or anything like that. There's a a mystery to some extent, and we know that there's sin in the world also. And so if you're drinking water, that's not potable and your body, you know, is suffering because somebody else polluted the water, that's sin. Mm -hmm. And we'll keep praying on this, but right now we have what we have and we're prayerfully working through it to understand it as best we can, and then to deal with it as best as we can. And I do have an interesting definition for you, Ollie, for your thoughts on page 33. This is the last one for today. It says, the total well-being of persons is the integration of each person's spiritual, psychological, and physical dimensions, the harmonious interrelationship of environmental, nutritional, social, cultural, and other aspects of life. Mm-hmm. How's that sound to you? It, it sounds spot on. In Zen Buddhism, they often talk about no dualism, no dualism, non-dualism. And that's really hard, especially for Western minds, because we think of ourselves as minds, bodies, spirits, Mm -hmm. and we keep them completely, they're separate things. This is not true. And that's a very dualistic way to think of it. The word for soul in Hebrew, nefesh, Mm -hmm. roughly translates to your throat, Often you hear this lift up your soul, really, it's like just stand up straight. That's Mm -hmm. one way you can think of it. Because our souls, our minds, our bodies, that's all interconnected. You can't get rid of one without getting rid of the other. If your soul is hurt, Mm -hmm. obviously your mind is going to be hurt. Mm -hmm. We can't divorce our minds from our bodies, our souls from our minds. And yet, how good are we at avoiding that? Or oh, yeah. eating our misery, for example, or just completely trying to ignore it and then it explodes someday. Right. I eat my misery because somehow my heart hurts, so I'm going to eat a cheeseburger with my mouth. Like, <laughs> yeah. How's that make sense? Not at all, but most no. people do it. Maybe yeah. not a cheeseburger, but you know, whatever your self medication of choice is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Ollie, we've tried to pack a whole lot into this conversation, starting with a really powerful Bible passage, diabetes, gluten, dairy, God, healthcare, and the works. Thank you so much for having, having me. Jesus's life is at work in you. Mm-hmm. Your life is at work in Jesus. And that probably makes your mind blow up, but it's kind of a summary of everything we've talked about. Mm. And some people might not think that that's true in their lives. So I always want to give a shout out Mm -hmm. to someone who may have been rejected by a human being affiliated with a faith-based organization who Mm -hmm. may have said that they are speaking for God Mm -hmm. and that you and I have a very broad sense of welcome of people Mm -hmm. and not rejecting people. It's not my place to judge you. Now, if you ask me for advice, I might have some advice for you, whether it's right or wrong, but we're not in the business of kicking people out of church. And I know that hasn't happened to everybody, but just in terms of that's really revolutionary what you said. Yeah. Your black life lives in Jesus. Your trans life lives in Jesus. Your disabled life quite literally lives in Jesus's body Mm -hmm. more than maybe any other ism I can think of right now. All our lives are at work in Jesus, and his life is in work in ours. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Ali. This has been excellent. Thank you for having me, and and God bless your, your work here. Dear Heavenly Father, today we offer up our bodies to you so you may heal us from the inside out. May your healing hands be upon our minds, our bodies, and souls. We place anything that is filled with sickness, with strong immunities, and healthy cells. We pray that you will anoint us with the sacred blood of Jesus Christ and be granted with strength and care today, tomorrow, and for all the days to come. 
We pray that you will grace each and every one of us with loving patience in your wisdom. Instill into us encouragement throughout our days to take the correct steps and to walk proudly and boldly to only do what is best for our bodies. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.